Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today it is the 22nd of March. And as I'm recording this video, there's an ongoing terrorist attack in northwestern Moscow within the Crocus City Hall. There was supposed to be a performance. And so you had a large amount of civilians accumulating in the theater room before it started. And at least five terrorists took advantage of that large gathering, entered into the city hall and that no mercy, they opened fire on everybody there. And as of now, it's reported that there were 40 dead and at least 100 wounded. Those numbers are most likely going to go up by the time this video is released. And really, it's just a horrible situation. Pray for everybody that's still in that city hall and their families, of course. But now the Russians are moving in. There was Gvardia Special Forces on uh, helicopters and armored vehicles to try to neutralize the active threats and to extinguish the fires that are still raging within that building. So I'm not going to get into the potential perpetrators, but I will say that on the 7th or the 8th of March, it was reported by the American embassy in Moscow that there was a threat of an extremist attack that would occur in an area with a large amount of people, like a large gathering. And so there was a warning that they released at a time just a couple of weeks ago with for the city of Moscow. So that is something to keep in mind. And of course, this is already being tied into the war with Ukraine. And we'll see how that unfolds in the coming days. But as of now, you do have statements from um, the Ukrainian side, for instance, with the spokesman for the Ukrainian intelligence agencies saying that it was a provocation from Russian special forces. And then on the Russian side, you have uh, Medvedev saying that, of course, uh, what he said was that they would target Ukrainian leaders if it was found that they were responsible for conducting that attack. But that's not the point of today's video. I want to try to focus on the front lines and on the recent Russian missile strikes that have been uh, now raging for over two days. We're now entering the third round of Russian strikes. But let's begin by looking at the situation on the Avdivka front. So in this sector, on the 21st of March, it was reported by the Russian MOD that they got full control of Tonike. And on the same day, Deep State reported that the Russian forces expanded their control getting control of additional open fields and over certain residential buildings within the northwestern sections of Tonenke. Based on their mapping though, there was still a small gray zone in the westernmost sections of that village, but by now the situation most likely has changed and we also have geolocated footage of Russian forces within some of those areas that Deep State did consider to be a gray zone. So first of all, we have a new video here from the 53rd mechanized or motorized brigade uh their pumba drone group fpv hitting a russian tank at the entrance to Torenke. and then over here we have a video which is again from pumba acting in collaboration with the alas store fpv drone group of the 25th uh, airborne brigade and they targeted a russian bmp that was making its way through this warehouse area and upon targeting it the infantry dismounted and were able to uh, make their way out towards the nearby tree line and then once again an FPV hit the BMP uh, double tapping it. So at this point it's extremely likely that the Russian forces have fully solidified control over the village while the Ukrainians really perhaps now two days ago completed their withdrawal from that village and a lot of that was caused due to the Russian forces getting full control over Orlivka and then utilizing the northern flank to attack the Ukrainian holdouts in the northwestern section of Tonenke. And so now looking at where the Ukrainians will withdraw, first of all, they are trying to build their next line of defense around the village of Omanske. And there, is, there are some questions about this open field area in between Atalova and Omanske and how defendable it is and where the Ukrainians will precisely defend because the Ukrainians do have this line of trenches that run along uh, these fields over here. And so the intention of the Ukrainian defense in this region, which I'm marking in the blue lines, was to defend against the Russian attacks that would be coming from the south. Because the assumption was that the Russian forces would reach Umanske or its southern flank by attacking from the south, of course, along this attack vector from an area like Vodiane. What they weren't expecting, based on the way they designed th these trenches, is that the Russian forces would get Avdivka and then assault from there, from the, in the eastern direction. And so you could just see that based on the design. And so now the Russian forces have an opportunity to flank those positions. Of course, they could still be used to a certain extent, but they will not be as effective. And of course, the Russian forces will utilize their advantage when it comes to elevation, which we'll see in a second, 
to continue advancing through these open areas that are not that well prepared. And so even behind that line, the Ukrainians are preparing for defenses that would be built, you could say, four kilometers westwards that would connect Natalove to Yasno Brodivka and Umanske itself. So it would run to something like this in the blue line. And that's where we're receiving a lot of the information of the Ukrainians uh, trying to build up that backup line. If we look at uh, the Manske area, there is a pretty large system of defenses that was built to the east of that village that runs like this in the blue lines. It is pretty close to Orlivka actually. And that is definitely a target of the Russian side if they want to overrun the current Ukrainian uh, forward defense line. And that's also something that's preventing the Russians from attacking Simonivka directly. Because if they're trying to attack Simonivka from the southern flank, they first have to bypass the defenses that were set up by the Ukrainians to the east of Umanske. If we look at the fortification map, or elevation map, sorry, you could see that with the capture of Tonenke, the Russian forces now have access to the fields that are located to the west. And those fields, they may seem like they're in a valley, but in the center where I have the marker mapped over here, you could see that there is slightly higher elevation. And so those sections could become a good target for the Russian side because from those positions, the Russians would have a local height that would be able to dominate all around in like a one kilometer radius all around looking towards the various valleys that are formed by the local gullies that you have set up in an area like Umanske, for instance. And so there would be a localized advantage for the Russian forces overlooking an area like Umanske. And then to the south, of course, the Talove. And so that's the advantage offered by these fields because, again, it is harder to store a large amount of troops and to connect them to the rear when you're located in an open field. And so by getting control of those areas, pushing them back, the Russian forces would then be able to get direct access towards these two villages, Umanske and the Talove, which are important for Ukraine's current positions that are to the east of the Vovcha River, which we'll get to in a second. Additionally, the capture of Tonenke undermines Ukraine's current defensive line around Simonivka for the same reason of them now being able to push westwards towards those fields. Of course, there is a certain level of disadvantage the Russians will be at if they try to attack from the southern flank towards Simonivka because of the fortifications, but also because they will be attacking uphill because the Ukrainian defensive positions, which I'll mark in um, blue, for instance, you can see them over here. Those defensive positions are largely located on a height that is overlooking the fields that I just discussed. And so there would be a certain level of difficulty to that. But at the same time, that's also why the situation around Berdichi is important to look at. Because you could see that the heights around Berdichi are on either parity or actually overlooking the Simonivka defenses. And also the village of Simonivka itself, which is a very narrow village. It could definitely and currently is definitely under heavy Russian fire, it's being exposed to FPV drones. I know for sure about that, but definitely in such a small area, you could see a large amount of fabs being dropped and artillery being fired towards the Ukrainian accumulations. That will make it extremely difficult to maintain forward positions over there without huge casualties. So with the current threats that are being posed by the current Ukrainian defensive line, they definitely have to look at their fallback lines or potential options. One that the Ukrainians definitely have built up is around the Vavcha River, which I've marked in orange. The Vavcha River, the advantage the Ukrainians have is, first of all, all around the perimeter, they already have defenses that are unified, connected as a central body, and they extend upwards towards Ocheritina. And Ocheritina, first of all, is also fortified. It's on a rail line that is located on the dominant height in the region. The only area that's on higher elevation is further south in the ridge located to the south of Avdivka under Russian control. Besides that, the Ukrainians do have a massive height advantage in this region. Overlooking the current Ukrainian defense line in the current Russian forward positions, you could say, and I'm marking red for a second, and also all the fields that currently Ukrainians control, but they would see to the Russians if they were to withdraw all the way westwards. And so there is an advantage in this region. Of course, there's also the body of water that they could take advantage of. And in some regions, the body of water is very wide. For instance, in the south around like Natalove located over here, you do have an extremely wide section of that river. But then as you go northwards, it becomes very narrow until it becomes virtually non-existent in some areas. My personal opinion is that once the Russians succeed in overrunning the current Ukrainian first line of defense, the Ukrainians will not withdraw to the Vovcha River immediately, 
And that's because of the range of Russian artillery systems and how far they would be able to fire onto the rear. Because based on that, let's say we measure the current Ukrainian line to be like around here. If the Ukrainians withdraw to this section, just for the sake of argument, which would be located on a gully because there are several gullies that extend out of the Vovch River. I'll mark them over here. There's this gully over here that extends out of the river. There's a gully over here. So they all extend out of it and they all could be used as fallback lines depending on how northwards the Ukrainians want to retreat. Let's say we give them the southernmost option of retreat, so the farthest away from the city of Pokrovsk. Even in that case, the Russians would only be around 26, 25 kilometers away from the city and its outskirts. And Pokrovsk is an extremely important city, one of the most important cities in Donetsk Oblast, still under their control. Massive logistical hub, command center, roads all meet over here, rail station connects the southern sector of Donetsk, connects to the eastern sector where we're seeing the heavy fighting right now and so obviously the russian artillery won't be firing directly from the front line but let's say they fire from orlivka which is would be at that point like i don't know eight kilometers deep into the front line that would only be around 34 35 kilometers away so of course it's with out of range for most of the shorter range russian artillery systems but could still be fired upon by, for instance, some self-propelled howitzers like the 2S7 uh, Pions, they could reach that area. They could reach some of the key sectors like the train station. Of course, if you're using rocket artillery, that could probably hit it even now, depending on where it's stationed because of the range. But again, it would be more advantageous as it gets closer in distance. And so, yes, there would be a threat of artillery shelling towards that key logistical hub that would undermine the connectivity of the Ukrainian defense if they immediately withdrew. And so what I believe is that the Ukrainians, they may take advantage of the local geography and set up an intermediary line. So this is just my own opinion, but you could see how there could naturally be a line of defense formed that connects the Cheratina to Natalove. And in that way, the Ukrainians would still be able to harness the effectiveness of the Cheratina and all of its defenses, and then go further south and retain control over certain fields located on high ground like this one over here. They would abandon some of the ridges to the east of the orange line, like around here. They would have to abandon those ones. And of course, Semenifica, for instance. And then they would be connected to Omanska over here into Natalove. And of course, they could utilize the Goldies, for instance, as a body of water to sort of extend the period of fighting for uh, additional time period. And that could be the intermediary line of defense. The only issue is it is not well built. The Vovcha, the Vovcha River line is pretty well built based on the fortification maps, which I'm probably going to move to my map. I'm going to export a, a file of it. And over here in the line I drew in orange, there are very scant levels of defensive preparedness. And so really that raises questions about how long it would be able to hold. Meanwhile, looking at the Bakhmut front, there were reports of movement around Klishivka. The Russian MOD, they claimed control over the Alobastroyava rail station, which is located to the east of Klishivka. We'll mark it on the map for you guys in red right over here. This is the section they claim to have under their control. Previously, the Ukrainians succeeded in taking it back uh, several months ago. And at the same time, Ukrainian sources haven't really talked about any sort of special change on the Klishivka front. At the moment, they have their map being showing that roughly the entire section I'm marking in these uh, red lines or the, these green lines is basically in the gray zone. In essence, all of the areas that are around the rail line and all of its subsequent fortifications. We also have this video here of the Russians firing um, with the BM-27 Oregon MLRS uh, firing artillery onto Klishivka. And the Ukrainian garrison that's defending over here is from the 92nd Assault Brigade and elements of the 80th Air Assault Brigade. Going further north, there is a large change that occurred to the north of Ivanivsky. And it's pretty interesting because Ivanivsky saw the Russian forces about a month ago had some success to the north of Ivanivsky and within the eastern sections of that village. But eventually it slowed down due to Ukrainian reinforcements being moved in due to high amount of Ukrainian FPV strikes on Russian vehicles and troop formations due to the Russian side conducting an operational pause to focus on other sectors and to rest their men after months of fighting. And now we're seeing the Russian forces trying to bypass the Ukrainian resistance hubs in the eastern section of that village. 
by attacking from the north. And by doing so, they also secured the fortifications the Ukrainians had built up to defend the northern flank of Ivanivsky. And so this is verified now based on video footage which shows the Perun drone unit of the 42nd Mechanized Brigade, one of the newer NATO trained units, uh, hitting a Russian BMD. And that was pretty deep into the previously imagined front lines. It's an advance in total of around uh, 1.2, 1.5 kilometers at most. And then also we have this video over here. This is from, I believe, several weeks ago that shows the Russian preparation for the assault, which shows Russian TOS-1A attacks onto those Ukrainian fortifications. So here's a quick sketch I made of the front line off the top of my head. First of all, you can see the bulge and how it's trying to flank the Ukrainians in eastern or western, sorry, Ivanivsky. But the other important point is that the Russians are now very close to reaching fields that would be on parity with the current Ukraine positions that are being built up, reinforcements being sent in, uh, fortifications being built on the Donbass Canal line. Because you can see these fields over here, the Russians are on the cusp of now taking. They are on equal elevation to the current Ukrainian positions that are being built up around the Kalinina suburb and around various other suburbs of Chassif Yar and around forests, around uh, generally the Donbass Canal Line, which is located on a very high elevated ridge. And so this would give the Russian forces finally an area, a vector where they could then build off of that and try to expand their offensive activities in an area where they wouldn't have the elevation disadvantage. So now let's get into the Russian missile strikes that have seen a massive uptick starting on the 20th of March during the nighttime. There was the first raid of the Russian side and most of the strikes I believe were reported within Kiev Oblast or within the city of Kiev directly. And so on that night, you had nine Russian 295M strategic bombers that took off along with you had MiG-31s. And based on security camera footage, and there was also New York Times nightline footage, there was videos of some of what appeared to be missile impacts. I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to say it with any sort of certainty. But there's also a bunch of aftermath photos from the residential areas that were either targeted by those missiles or was caused by damage from failed air defense systems or debris from the air defense systems that intercepted Russian missiles. I really can't determine what it was, but either way, there was damage caused from the to the residential buildings and the parking lots and also to some warehouses. And according to Ukraine's MOD, they're saying they intercepted 100% of the missiles from that particular day, including two out of two ballistic missiles, which were either Iskander M's, KN-23s, or the KH-47 M2 Kinzels. And they also claim to have intercepted 29 out of 29 KH-101 slash 555 air launch cruise missiles. At the same time, the Russian MOD, they claimed that they used the Kinzels to strike decision-making centers in Kiev and that their strikes achieved their goals. Now, regardless of whether either of the claims from those respective MODs are true, the Ukrainians did likely have more success in intercepting Russian missiles on day one because, first of all, it was the first round of Russia's barrage of strikes. Also, less missiles were launched on the first night than the second. And there is extremely heavy air defense coverage around the city of Kiev, especially in comparison to other oblasts. And so, recently, Ukrainian air defense systems have been degraded in other parts of the front line. A big example of that that was actually released today was from footage showing a NASAM's air defense system that was struck by Russian missiles. And in that one, it shows the uh, command and control center for the NASAMs and also the uh, actual launcher being struck by missiles. And so that destruction, it only occurred three kilometers from where the first NASAMs was confirmed to be destroyed. So now there's two that have been visually confirmed to be destroyed in very close proximity. So maybe they were from around the same incident, from like around the same day they were targeted. I'm not sure that, uh, based on the timeline, but either way, it was over the past month or two. And during the past month, based on published footage from the Russian side, there has been destruction to seven of those Ukrainian air defense systems and nine Western or Soviet-made radars. And so definitely has been a degradation in a lot of the air defense systems. And that either causes a local degradation 
in air defense coverage in areas like Zaporozhye, or it degrades the Ukrainian air defense elsewhere on the rear because they're forced to move in those assets to defend the front line. So on the night of the 21st of March, we got much more proof of Russian strikes actually hitting targets. On that night, you had at least 12 295s, uh, 4 222Ms, 6 MiG-31s, uh, really flying around the skies around the Caspian, for instance. And there were air raid sirens alerted in every single oblast in Ukraine. And so that was the first time yesterday the Russians carried out a large-scale campaign targeting Ukrainian energy infrastructure since the last wave, which occurred a year ago in March of 2023. And so the most notable strike that occurred yesterday was from four KH-101 cruise missiles. And as they were being launched, there is actually footage of this, which I've linked on my map, showing the deployment of decoy flares before hitting the Dnipro hydroelectric power plant. And so here we do have the geolocation for that. So you could see that they uh, the missiles hit the power plant. They didn't cause any sort of flooding, but it did cause, uh, first of all, the power plant to stop generating electricity. And in essence, the plant is divided into two different plants. There's a uh, hydro plant one and two. And so the second one is currently in critical condition. Damage is still being assessed in the plant, but uh, they're looking at trying to restore the first one, but they're talking about how the second one might not be restored due to extensive damage to the turbine hull. And within the first one, there wasn't much damage done to the turbine hull. And so there is talk about it being potentially restored. And then you have uh, Ukrn Ergo, however you pronounce the Ukrainian energy company's name. They reported the disconnection of the 750 kilovolt overhead line to the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. And so that line, it does imply that if it was damaged, that there was damage incurred to the substation that is located around 112 kilometers away from it called the Dniprovskaya 750 substation. So this is a really common theme. We get reports about damage to certain lines and then we get also information about widespread blackouts for a very extended period of time, like eight hours, 10 hours, that's a very long time. And so then there's a debate as to whether that means the Russians directly targeted a substation, which I can't say for certain if there's not any footage of it, but it could be a possibility, a very real possibility in some cases, or maybe it's a rolling blackout for, from the Ukrainian side. So then you have a very similar example of a potential Russian strike due to damage to the overhead wires at the Pavlovrod substation, which is uh, 330 kilovolts. Additionally, the reports of very serious power outages around Kriviri, and that could be associated with the Russians targeting the thermal power plant in that section, but there's no confirmation of that. At the same time, there were reports of power outages and an emergency schedule being instituted within Kurovrohod Oblast, and that is being reported due to information coming from Russian sources. Uh, for instance, Rybar, they had a pretty extensive documenting of the various substations they claim were hits. And one such substation, they say, is the Ukrainka 330 kilovolt substation. I couldn't find it on the map, but in all likelihood, it's around the city of Krokvinitsky. Additionally, there were reports of targeting of the Ladizhinska thermal power plant and the Borstein thermal power plant. So that's pretty interesting because most of them were substations, but now there are some power plants that were targeted even in Western Ukraine. And some of that information is coming from the fact that there is continued heightened electricity flow coming in from Moldova, Romania, and Slovakia to try to support the Ukrainians. That would indicate that at least during the earlier stages of March 22nd, that these power plants were not actually generating any electricity. And then we also received information about potential targeting of substations around Chepatifka 330 and then in the uh, Kamelmanitske uh, thermal or substation. And so a lot of these have been targeted in previous Russian strikes that occurred either in like November of 2022. Remember when Surabikin had his campaign of targeting these substations, but also during March of 2023. So we're seeing a lot of recurring names indicating that they were restored pretty quickly by the Ukrainian side and returned to their baseline levels of uh, electricity. And so now they're being targeted yet again. 
And then, of course, we also have information about uh, the Mirahorod 330 substation being targeted by the Russian side. The most extensive damage to the electricity grid was done in Kharkiv ob ob Oblast, especially in the city of Kharkiv, where there's information about the targeting of all three substations within the city of Kharkiv. In particular, in those three substations, the Russians tried targeting the auto transformers, and they also went out and attacked the Kharkiv and Zhmivka thermal power plants. And so in terms of the results, it does show that the Russian forces were able to uh, give a, sh a certain short-term blow. That's, of course, obvious based on statements from the Ukrainian energy companies looking at the certain blackouts that were caused as a result, or the rolling blackouts that the uh, Ukrainians had to institute as a result. But then in terms of really looking at the long-term effects, the Ukrainian energy uh, grid in general won't be on the verge of collapse at the current pace where the Russian forces only every half year or even every year conduct a large wave of strikes because of course the Ukrainians do have the wherewithal even now to try to restore to a baseline level and of course they're using strategies such as rolling blackouts to prevent uh, maximum uh, damage being caused and so really there won't be any sort of major shift unless we see that there is a change in the frequency of these Russian attacks in the intensity of their attacks, I mean, in, in terms of the scale, but also in terms of which targets they select. Because even within these rounds of strikes that we just saw on the 21st of March, we didn't see that all of the thermal power plants were targeted, and we didn't see that the specific squid gears within Ukraine's nuclear power plants were targeted, and that would have played a big role in completely undermining Ukraine's energy grid. Per the Ukrainian MOD, the Russians launched 151 UAVs and missiles, and just citing what they say, they claim to have intercepted 55 out of 63 Shahids, 35 out of 40 KH-101s, 22 out of 2 KH-54 cruise missiles, 0 out of 12 Iskander and ballistic missiles, 0 out of 5 kh twenty two, and then 0 out of 70 Kinzels, which are the hypersonic air launch ballistic missiles, and then 0 out of 22 S-300s. And so even today... On the 22nd of March, on this current night, the Ukrainians did report on pretty large-scale air raids in the southern and eastern parts of Ukraine. In particular, there are reports of strikes going on around Odessa. There's some imagery coming out of fires. There was a strike reported at an oil storage section within a port. So we're going to have to wait and see about the information regarding the damage incurred in that direction. So this current wave of strikes does coincide with the Belgorod shelling that the Ukrainians have launched and also, of course, the raids into Belgorod and Kursk Oblasts. So there is, of course, the coincidental timing, but based on the scale of the attacks and the depth of the planning by the Russian side, they definitely had this in mind for many months. And you can also see that based on the patterns for when the Russians save up on missiles and build additional ones for production and then begin to output them during various set times throughout the year. And so we saw the last major Russian campaign of airstrikes in general, mainly targeting Ukrainian military installations, was around the uh, summer or really late or late summer, early autumn of 2023. We could see how that basically ended by the end of September. So then you had like two and a half months where based on, again, only Ukrainian MOD numbers because they're the ones reporting on when these air raids occur. And based on their numbers, like when an air raid occurs, those numbers aren't really disputed. What's really disputed is the interception numbers. But regardless, what we see is there was a two and a half month period where there weren't many Russian strikes. Then as the new year commenced, you know, going into December and then especially at the beginning of 2024, we saw a massive increase in the scale of the Russian attacks. And this period of strikes was sustained for a really large uh, amount of time compared to some of the other strikes. It was for several weeks that the Russians were outputting uh, these amount of strikes going into January and then February. And then you could see how by like mid-February, the numbers really dwindled. And so you had this like, well, one month period where the numbers were pretty low, pretty similar to the autumn numbers in this blue line over here. And then it just jumbled up. You can't see it on the graph because the graph is um, from a couple of days ago. But of course, there's now a massive uptick based on the reporting that Russia launched just on the 21st, 151 UAVs and missiles.
So really seeing how the window of time where the Russians were building up the production got shortened by such a large amount, reducing a month and a half in between the previous strikes in the new year and the current round of strikes compared to the gap that was in between summer and New Year's, you can see there is a sizable reduction by the Russian side. And so now it's only a matter of time before we see if the Russians do continue this for a sustained period of time. Of course, eventually the missile strikes are going to stop, but then we have to see about how frequent they become if this is not the new status quo. If it isn't, then we could see a change. We could see more tangible effects as to what happens with Ukraine's energy system if the Russians continue targeting that. And so that's all I have for today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.